Good day to you all. Uh, I am coordinator of the program on cultures of sustainability center for cultural research and development of Lingnan University in Hong Kong. I'm also a founding member of the Global University for Sustainability and director of its executive team. So let me first introduce the nine interpreters for today. Be uh, for Spanish English, we have Julieta Mendez and Mercedes Pico. For English Chinese, we have Huan Xiaomei and Li Menghong. For Japanese and Chinese, we have Liu Jia, Wang Dai, and Li, Liu Jia Jun. For Portuguese and Chinese, we have Chen Wen, Wang Yifan. So we thank our, translate, our interpreters very much for facilitating this uh, dialogue among us. So my co-moderator today is Professor Dai Jinghua. Professor Dai Jinghua is a leading feminist cultural critic in China. She is professor in the Institute of Comparative Literature and Culture and director of the Center for Film and Cultural Studies at Peking University. Her research interests include popular culture, film studies, and gender studies. She is the author of many books, including Invisible Writing, Cultural Studies in China in the 1990s, Breaking Out of the Mirror City, Cinema and Desire, Masked Night, The Writings of Subcommander Marcos, after the post-Cold War, the future of Chinese history, among others. Her works have been translated into English, French, German, Italian, Spanish, Japanese, and Korean. Her literary, film, and TV commentary addresses a large audience in China. Before I hand over the floor to Professor Dai, I would like to say a few words. Today is the Zhongyuan Festival the 15th full moon of the seventh month in the lunar calendar. From the Han Dynasty onwards, this has been a day for celebrating early autumn harvests, for paying tribute to the god of the land and of the earth. Later, the tribute is paid to the ancestors and to all ghosts. So this is also called the festival of the ghosts. The word ghost would cause some of us to associate with the word spectre. And of course, the famous beginning of the Communist Manifesto in 1848, that a spectre is haunting Europe, the spectre of communism. Today, when the world is faced with so many crises and even civilizational collapse, it is high time to revisit the spectres. After 33 sessions of the 9th South South Forum on Sustainability, after many eminent scholar activists have offered their analysis, today, in our final session, we focus on steps forward for the South, solidarity, non-alignment, and a new international. I would also like to say that four years ago, on this very day, our dear friend and mentor, Professor Samir Amin, passed away in Paris. His last book was entitled, The Long Revolution of the Global South Toward a New Anti-Imperialist International. So you can see this here. So you can download the book for free on the Global University website. So it is also to pay tribute to Samia Min that we have this discussion today. So now uh, over to you, Professor Dai. So this is a very special day. Today we have the we have the last session of the South South Forum, and we will also have one of the most prominent um, uh, uh, scholars from China. So I'm very honored to be today's uh, today's uh, moderator. Thank you, thank you, Lao Qinqi, Lao Qinqi and Wang Hui for such an opportunity. And we all know that Wang, Professor Wang Hui is a leading contemporary Chinese scholar, but I would like to call him a thinker. And he is also the founding director of the Tsinghua Institute for Advanced Study in Human, Humanities and Social Science. And he is very rare. He teaches both in, at Tsinghua University, both as distinguished professor of literature and 
The history is one of the esteemed scholars in fields of intellectual history, social theory, and modern literature. Wang Fei graduated with a PhD degree in Chinese literature from the Chinese Academy of Social Science in 1988. In 1996 to 2007, he served as the co-chief editor of Du Shu magazine, which is the most influential intellectual journal in China. The other co-chief editor is yesterday's speaker, which is Huang Ping. His major works include the birth of the century, and this is this is um this is for this is the first volume of China's 20th century. The other two volumes are forthcoming, and and he said that there will be so another two is on the way. So this is uh, like a three volumes uh, masterpiece, and also one of his most important and advanced uh, 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 uh and, and anthology is the politics of uh, the rise of modern Chinese thought is uh, the polo the politicized politics the politics of imagining Asia among others his books have been translated into English Japanese Korean Italian German Spanish Portuguese Slovenian etc into different so it was introduced to different continents and different languages. Wang Wei is also the recipient of no, of many awards, such as um, 2000, 2013 Luca Pacelli Prize, which he shared with, with Habermas in Italy, and also analyst Meyer Research Award in 2018 in Germany. So I would like to consider him as my friend and also comrade. And also we shared almost 40 years of friendship and also discussing we have been facing in we have been together in face of many challenges so this is my introduction to uh professor wang Hui. now let's invite lao kin chi um, please wang Hui. thank you thank you professor lao kin chi and professor dai Jinghua. i'm very pleased because today I, again once again and in the south south forum i have joined the forum many times and i would like to see the many more to come that's why and that's this is what i would like to contribute to as a, a foreign and as, as a career so earlier kinchi mentioned this is a very special day first this is the day of the ghost in china well you can call it ghosts you can call it specters and i believe that in the modern world from the since starting from the statement of uh, of, of Marx, so this spe specter also has its own meaning and definition. And also, four whole years ago, Samil Amin left us. And today, our discussion, I choose this topic, which is solidarity, non-alignment, and new international. This is my tribute to him and also trying to is it could be considered as an extension of his question so 10 whole years ago in the winter of uh, 2012 samil amin was in Tsinghua university and uh, and delivered a lecture well he had done this many times this is just one of it uh, which is 10 years ago and that the topic is the in explosion of the contemporary capitalist uh, crisis and later on he, he also published it in as a thesis i read it many times and i think there are lots of insights in it even after 10 years after 10 years of a reflection i still benefit from it so now this uh i will try to start with his uh with his insights so first this is the neoliberalism's height but he is going towards a very deep crisis because the background is the 2008 uh, financial crisis so he made a few judgments first he think this neoliberalism system is actually a un it's is a globalization of the of the capitalism uh monopoly so first it used a global it is globalization that's the first characteristic and then second is financial financialization the financial globalization and financialization is how it can sustain its own operation and he think that this system back in the 2012 he said this system is is 
is going through an in explosion in front of us because it's it's um it's agree it's its inner problems will definitely go into a dead end. That's why he described two different uh, directions. First is the highly, highly, um, highly inequalities, because it's like waging a war. The capitalist is waging a war against the grassroots, the best, the people of the best. Their capitalist, the, the capitalist, the capitalism is going in the direction of the privatization. And secondly, he said that this is a phase of social conflicts. So for sure, there would be international conflicts and also the military intervention of the hegemony. So at that time, he mentioned those three three big heads, which means the, um, North, the Europe, West Europe, America, and Japan. So this try, this, 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 they will continue to um they will continue to to take control of the people of the other countries and this is the only way they have also this situation i think has been become very obvious especially in today's situation and also he also mentioned that at that time the response of the people is is powerless. For example, this kind of uh, the, uh, a market adjustment, all like trying to go back to the situation after the Second World War, or trying to reach a consensus of humanitarian, or go back, or or or, or, or go back to the individualism. None of this can 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 help to reduce the uh, to solve these conflicts that is now without solution. That's why he come up with a very radical uh, solution. Later on, I might go, go back to this uh, this question. Today, we can say that 10, this, all of these judgments before 10 of 10 years ago is now playing right in front of us. We can see that the imperialism is compared to, com compared to before, now they have a different rhetoric. They are becoming just the, they are in a very brutal way and try and without any cover, without any loin clothes. And China is right in the center spot. Now I would like to come up with an example. In 2012, in uh, in in May two of the in 26th of May, American addressed the um, administration's approach to the People's Republic of China. So in this. In this approach to, in this statement, they say that to build such a future, we must defend and, and reform the rules based on international order, which means the system of laws, agreements, principles, and institutional mechanisms that international community came together after two world wars to govern relations among nations, prevent conflict, and uphold the rights of all people. The funny thing is, it sounds quite similar to the Bandan, um, Bandan principles. They are trying to, they are trying to establish the concepts of self-determination, sovereignty, and peaceful settlement of disputes. It looks, it looks quite similar to Bandan experience because, in the Bandan conference, the the charter of the United Nations was also emphasized, but later on, I will say why they are totally different or completely opposite, because the enemy of Bandung Conference was imperialism and America's rivals were China and Russia. And actually, what they are trying to do is to trying to sustain the bipolar bipolar system, which is mentioned by Sami Amin, which is the, 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 the center and the peripheral system. So in the talk, he says, although, although the war aged by the America is still going on, which referring, which means the, which means the, 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 um, the uh, Ukrainian war, they said that the main challenge comes from the People's Republic of China. There are three keywords. Of the that comes from the United States government, this which is invest, align, and competition, compete. So the investments, the so-called investments is 
they mentioned that um, it is infrastructure, education, science and technology research and development under the national plan. They say that these investments will not only make America stronger, they will also make us a stronger partner and ally. And today I just saw something very interesting. Well, in the Chips and Science Act, one of the bill sponsors, which is the Republican US Sena Sen Senator Toad Young, he said, the country that wins the race in critical technology will be the superpower of the future and we can't afford to lose that race. In other words, the, invest, the main purpose of the invest, investments, no matter domestic or international, is to sustain this superpower, this superpower structure. That's why they want to use new and stronger export controls, which means on the other side is a is a shift in military investment from platforms aimed at 20th century conflicts to more remote, harder to detect and easier to move asymmetric systems. And the second word is align because as what they have already mentioned, actually including the US-Japan Security Alliance, the US-Korea South Security Alliance, and also the Taiwan as, an, as a non-NATO partner, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, what? And also the Indo-Pacific Partnership for Maritime Domain Awareness and AUKUS, Australia, which include, uh, includes Australia, UK and America, and also the US-EU Trade and Technology Council. Later, uh, need, not need to mention G7 and also the, the NATO that is in way of exp expansion. There has already, already, uh, uh, already include their North European partners. And this is what US mean by align. No matter it is the investment or the align, they all include the elements, this kind of awareness of competition because they're using their own words, as they say, they want to ensure our military stays ahead of the curve. We will seek to maintain peace through a new approach, approach that we call integrated deterrence, including allies and partners working in all areas of conven conventional nuclear space and information and draw greater strength from our mutually reinforcing economic, technological and diplom diplomatic domains. So I said that, yes, a pair, it looks like they also have reference to the Charter of the United Nations and also the um, Human Rights uh, Declaration, etc. But so now let's go back to the Bandan spirit. Why they are so different? Because, well, Bandan spirit is about unity, but not alliance. Or that's why um, the President Sukarno. He, in his op op opening address to the Bandan conference, he says, we are all united by something more important than what divides us. We are, we are united, for example, by our common dislike of colonialism in whatever form it takes. We are united by a common dislike of racism. We are united, we are united by a common determination to preserve and stabilize world peace. So the second topic is also about peace, but not hegemony. It's not hegemony to maintain oneself as a superpower. As Premier Joe said during the Bandung conference, Asian and African people are more concerned about how valuable it is to have world peace and national independence because of this this has to be their common aspiration to maintain world peace and fight for national independence and work towards friendly relationship among nations towards this and then the third aspect is independence rather than exclusion also as premier Zhou said it's not only about political independence but it also has to do with economic independence but not with exclude not 
the exclusion against other countries in the world. We have this 10 principles of the Bandung Conference. The first one is respect for fundamental human rights and for the purpose and the principles of the Charter of the United Nations, yet still distinctly different from the United States stance. And number six of these principles is abstention from the use of arrangements of collective defense to serve the particular interests of any of the big powers abstained by any nation from exerting pressure on other countries. And seven is refraining from acts or threats of aggression or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any country. And precisely these two items are conversely different uh, on the opposite country of the US stance. And it also demonstrates global South countries common stance. It is still obvious against this backdrop of wars. I also noticed that since the outbreak of the Russian-Ukrainian war, major countries of the non-alignment countries, no matter how different their political interests or their values are, they all unanimously reject the US proposal for sanction, no matter it's India, Indonesia, Serbia, Egypt, or China, or whatever other non-alignment countries, no one was following the imperialist powers. From this regard, we can see that the Bandung spirit is still a, 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 a tradition that is still well alive. So how can we view the internationalist practice in the 20th century. We should have new interpretations in this regard. Recently, I participated in some act event where I also mentioned all the topics I'm talking about today. And a scholar, a diplomat who's long been engaging in diplomatic work, whom I respect, that, that because of the end of the Cold War and collapse of uh, the two blocks of these third world country movements, such as non-alignment movements, are no longer significant. My opinion is different. First of all, we need to know how do we understand this third world internationalism. In my opinion, it is not a norm of order that has been completed but it's a continuous movement that continue to fight against imperialism and colonialism. Only solidarity from third world and their resistance can form the new powers of international relationships in the 20th century. So we should view this from a perspective of agency and change and evolution. Structural change does not mean that this tradition is no longer relevant. Second, we still have the, the world order today is a periodical achievement of all the struggles around the world. Yet most of our attention were majorly attracted by the hegemonic powers and less by our fight against the hegemonic powers. For example, the UN Charter, including China's return to the United Nations with the help of all the third world, of third world countries are examples. Without this fight against imperialist power, we will no longer be able to talk about what we're talking about today this way. So it is not only an outcome of the game among superpowers, but it also has something to do with all the third world efforts to reshape this continuously. Also in this regard, the third world is not simply a geographical uh, term. It not only has to do with 
economic development, first of all, is a political term. It is a conscious political movement who took that took shape during the fight against imperialism. And also it has to do with the concept of a world order that emerged from this experience. So the third world is also connected with this historical process. The solidarity of third world internationalism that brought up by the Bandung Conference is precisely this thing that we're mentioning today, this struggle, this movement the, by the third world countries. This movement has something to do with the in societal movements. So in China, the most important great tradition of Chinese revolution is the United Front. In the very beginning, initially, it has the double significance domestically and internationally. That is because imperialism is not simply a international system, but has seeped into all the different parts of the society, such as military, economy, politics, society, culture, and so on. So experience of third world internationalist movement cannot be isolated from each society's own struggles. It is not just a practice in the domain of international relationships, it's a continuity of struggles. To guarantee the success, it not only needs the revolutionary powers, we also need to go beyond the border of class and unite whoever can be united so that we can have agency domestically and globally. We not only need alliance among socialist countries, but we also need to go beyond the ideology and unite whatever power that can be united, which leads to the form forming of the great unity among all peoples of the world. This is an achievement of the Bandung Conference. China, although as a socialist country, China always considers itself as part of the third world country. So in Sarmi Arming's paper on marking the 60th anniversary of the Bandung Conference, he said that a, the Bandung Conference is an announcement of the third world country's will to regain its sovereignty and achieve independence. It is connected, it, it connects both the, its domestic significance and its international significance. Under this framework, this framework of the post, the Cold War two block structure, how the third world struggles are powers to decode war. So our thought about this periodical end of the Cold War needs to take place in all in the perspe perspective of all the long process of the 20th century and not just the historical moments where the US and the USSR settle for peace and the end of peace, the end of, excuse me, the Cold War needs to be defined in this very comprehensive, complex process. The struggle and pursuit for international solidarity and eco order during the struggle for national liberation, it needs to redefine nation, independence, and all other terms. It needs to go beyond the national state, the nation state, and search for universality around the world. It has been curbed by the post-Cold War order, but it has never been far away. So how do we view the third world internationalism and 20th century socialist movements. From the historical examples of Russia and China that support and mutual and connect, closely connected with global international 
anti-colonial movements, they can see that they are important forces that participate in shaping post-war international order. The middle ground, however, once it has a has its own political agency, it, it used to be the, the predecessor of the third world theory, the term third world, but it has its agency. It's no longer subjugated to bigger powers. And using the two block model to oversimplify the international order, will cover up the important anti-hegemony, anti-imperialist struggle by the middle ground. It shows their agency, but it may not be yet complete. This subjectivity and this agency is not still not far away, and we need to recall this and maintain it. The Banda moment is named after the Sivan is precisely because the conscious expression of this agency. This, all these struggles we've mentioned today have profoundly reshaped the global landscape. The UN as a symbol of the restructuring of world order after the two world wars, it was no longer the tool of hegemonic powers, but it has become an arena for power struggle among different different relations, including the third world countries. And the universal value as embodied in its charter have to come new values because of the third world movements against hegemony. So we can see that in the future, they will still have other forms of struggle. They need wide participation from third world countries and that they should not be controlled or subjugated by the hegemonic powers. So in this regard, what we're talking about is the uncomplete, unfinished cause of the 20th century. The two new things of the last century was socialist countries and third world internationalism. These two new things hit the capitalist and imperialist world order hard. And it also have its own characteristics of its own period of time. It has a, Socialist movement has a long history, and then they also talk about this factor thing. But only by the 20th century have socialist countries came into being in places such as Russia or China. Accompanying this process emerged third world internationalism. They are also new, uh, something different from those in the 19th century. But the clubs of the USSR and because of the end of the Cold War and everything like that, we see they seem third world movements seem less relevant because of the necessity of third world movements. We need to analyze deeper into these historical events and then they need to know how to analyze its internal contradictions and deterioration. If we cannot see the, how fragile and contradictory the Bandung spirit can be in a historical era, in a longer term, we won't have bigger success. We need to analyze national liberation movements with colonialist history. I remember in the article on the 60th anniversary of the Bandan Conference, Sarmi Armin mentioned a few reasons for the pause or suspension of the Bandan Bay. One is the intervention from imperialist countries. Second are the coup d'etat of the internal 
reactionary powers. It also ended, put many Bandung spirit countries to end, such as Indonesia, Egypt, Mali, Ghana, and many others. Historically, the USSR and China have their own specific contradictions, and they are on the right. They were on the right. And all the conflicts and the specific contradictions of their own national populist experience have laid away for imperialist backlash. So against this backdrop, during a period of time, this abundant spirit seemed to be less relevant or even absent. So, so he defined the time between 1980 to 2010, a time without Bandan and without non-alignment movement. Also, it is also the period of the expansion of global neoliberalism. It is very necessary for us to streamline the powers today to fight against the in the problems caused by the imbalance of neoliberalism this in imperialist globalization but we all know that samuel amin proposed this concept of de-linking however imperialism is also bringing up this pseudo de-linking de uh, that is because the so-called de-linking were used to serve their financial science, financial manipulistic hegemony and that in science and technology. It is no real de-linking, but their strategy and measures to maintain their hegemonic power. But however things may be, in words of Samuel Armin, non-alignment and third world solidarity still achieve important accomplishments. He said that all Asian and African countries benefited from this movement in the terms of the of economics, they brought a return. For example, without OPEC or non-alliance movement, a country like Gabon won't have that good amount of petrol, oil, and gas rent. Therefore, the focus should be on political solidarity. And this movement continue and always support struggle against the colonialism, including armed struggles, such as that for Portuguese colonies of Zimbabwe. So we can see they've achieved, this movement have achieved important accomplishments in this regard. So following the collapse of the USSR and the end of the two block system, all the historical global international conditions have changed greatly, but still we cannot see that the tradition of Bandan is over. We've mentioned that all uh, the attitudes of the non-alignment movement countries uh, facing the Russian-Ukrainian war is already an example. So if we go back to this, we should talk about the current situations. So the first condition, I think, is because of the vulnerability and dangers of the neoliberal global systems. Well, 10 years ago, and in Samuel Amin's lecture, he already mentioned that in this kind of uh, neoliberal global system, you can see this brain seeking of the of the uh, imperialism and also the maximization of the monopolies. Also, as long as the imperialism and financialization as the as the two wings of the globalization, and he mentioned that, and also the five monopolies and their unsustainability. He had a definition of emergence of what is emerging, what is emerging countries. A country, he defined the emergence as, I will just like give a very short description. So he said a country can only be 
an emerging country if its goal is to build an internal market inwardly rather than outwardly, and thus to establish national economic sovereignty. Achieving this complex goal requires the establishment of sovereignty in all aspects of economic life, in particular policies to protect food sec security and food sovereignty, as well as sovereignty over the country's natural resources and even the ability to access natural resources out of its territory. These multiple and complementary goals are distinct from those of a comprador or comprador bourgeoisie re regime. So they will be content to pursue only the model of growth and the possibilities granted by the dominant global system. So this kind of autonomy, this kind of sovereignty is necessary to be called, uh, to be defined as an emerging countries. In that sense, the success of an emerging nation is measured by its ability to counter the dominant powers control over five so-called five five uh, monopolies which is which are scientific and technological development access to natural resources the global financial and monetary system information dissemination and weapons of mass destruction so i have mentioned many times developing countries need a a a, 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 a very independent and also a different relation of openness and autonomy they need a relationship between a balance between this kind of unity and non-alignment they need be they need to be autonomous and open but also on the other way in, on the other aspect is the unity and non-alignment so today do we have such a possibility later i believe mark mark marco and micah will come up with their and they will, will, will come up with their questions and answers from the perspective of Latin America and also Africa. In the beginning of this century, especially in Latin America, but also have uh, impact on, 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 on Asia, for example, the 21st, for 21st century movement. So all of this movement, all of this socialist movement in the 21st century, Although they might went through some setbacks, but they still show great potential. In Latin America, in many countries, there's still, a, the, no matter how long they have been suffered from the Americans, uh, Americans uh, in penetration of the right wing, including coup, they, they, but they still have this kind of new left wing wave. This is, important and I believe lots of other countries also need to pay attention to. This is already happening in Latin America and in Africa. All of these social struggles in all of these different places needs to be needs to be taken into account. And also secondly, the aim of the struggle is still the same. This is what Samir Amin has already has already has already seen that the first what we need to do is demonopolization and definalization, also the dependence. This is what we should be striving for. This is what we our efforts should be put into. And thus came a series of questions. But also, of course, they are all included in their own different modes of development. Do we need to have see what we are we do we want to see the shift of the center of the capitalism or do we want a new economic and social experiments? Because the shift of the center of the capitalism has been talking for many years, ever since the the emerging countries in Asia, uh, such as the Japan and etc. But we cannot limit our discussions of bandan spirit to just a shift of the center of capitalism. What we want are new economic and social experiments. Um, earlier, like for example, Professor Wen Tiejun and, and my colleagues and et cetera, lots of scholars have already talked discussing about the um, rural issues of agricultural farmer and rural area and also the the new um, ecological ecological um, agriculture and also what Chinese government is promoting the dual circulation 
along with what uh, Samia Min talked about, the nationalization and socialization and the search for a mass democracy not subordinated to capitalist reproduction. And also, of course, a 20, 21st century third war inter inter internationalism. On this sense, I think we can we can reread what Al Sami Amin mentioned and also Marxist Marx Marx mentioned. He said, "No, what ki whatever kind of form, it cannot, it cannot, it, it cannot ignore the e ecological um, aspect, because today the crisis that we are facing, we need a new organization of the social politics. This is what the capitalism cannot afford to us." The second is about principle. Marxist, Marxist mentioned the accumulation of capital already destroyed the base of the nature, which means the which is about the alienation of the human beings, of the labor, and also the alienation of the nature, etc. So on such in such on such sense, a new experiment, a new vision has to be has to be rethink and so that we can form the base for the new international. So I will discuss, the, my, my presentation will be till here. And after the other two speakers, we can have a further discussion. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Wang Hui. Uh, so before we go into an interactive session among the panelists, I would like to invite um, Marco Fernandez to speak. Uh, Marco Fernandez is a researcher at the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, which is a pillar of the International People's Assembly. He is a member of the No Cold War campaign and is a co-founder and co-editor of News on China, Dongsheng. He holds a bachelor's and master's degree in history, a doctorate in psychology from the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Now he lives in Beijing. So, uh, Marco, please. Thank you. Well, so first of all, um, it's a great honor to be here. So I'd like to thank the organizers, um, Professor Lao Kim Chi, Professor Sid Sui. Also very nice to meet you, Professor Dai Jin Hua. Thanks for also the presentation. Hope we can meet sometime in Beijing. Uh, also I'd like to thank to the interpreters, a very hard task, as we know, very long uh, panel, and also everyone behind the scenes, because we know that to uh, organize such a panel, it's a lot of work um, before. And so thank you, everyone involved. And also, of course, I'd like to uh, um, ask for a toast to Comrade uh, Samir Amin, great thinker and a great inspirer of all our struggles in this special day. So um, I would like to start in the spirit of uh, the, the Day of the Ghosts, as also well reminded uh, by Professor Lau, and, and thinking about this image that you, uh, it was very good to bring back this image of the Communist Manifesto. So, uh, unfortunately, I think the specter of communism is no longer haunting Europe at this point of the history. But um, we could say that maybe, in the spirit of also the speech of Professor Wang Hui, which I also like to thank uh, for the uh, also to bring us to the panel to the dialogue. Um, but maybe the specter of Bandung is haunting the empire is haunting the global north. Uh, it's true, it's not yet the communist expecture as many of us here would like, but I think this moment of history, it's also a very crucial uh, moment. And yes, I, I think we could say that the specter of Bandung of the non-line movement is haunting the world again, and especially the empire. So I would like to, in this brief presentation to um, raise three key points. First of all, starting with um, some sort of like the current political, global political situation. Um, 
that I think it's a very special moment as Professor Wang was also um, saying. Second one, I think it's very important of course to bring the current political status of uh, Latin America. I mean, there's a very in interesting moment, historical moment in the region again. And the third thing is to bring some reflections about the relationship between Latin America and China, because um, I think this is also a critical um, and a, a critical relationship and a very strategic one that has a huge potential in terms of uh, shifting uh, some 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 issues of the global global order. So first of all, um, about the current global situation. Um, so we are bringing Marx and Samir Amin. So I would like uh, would like also to bring um, one more very important communist thinker, which is Vladimir Lenin. So Lenin had a very uh, sentence, a very strong sentence that I think it also summarizes what's happening in the last months in the world, especially after the beginning of the Ukrainian conflict. So Lenin uh, used to say that, or once said that there are decades when nothing happens, but there are weeks when decades happen. So after the beginning of the Ukrainian conflict, what looks like, what we feel like, it's the history is speeding up in front of us. Some of the trends, political, economical, global trends that we've been seeing the last 20 years, some of them 10 years, uh, they have been, uh, they are speeding up since um, end of February. So just one quick example, if we take what happened between in June, between June 6th and June 30th, which means 24 days in June, just two months ago, First, we had the Summit of Americas. That was probably the biggest diplomatic failure of US in the last decades. Probably you, you, you saw that um, US blocked the uh, presence of Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua to the meeting in LA. And it, this was responded first by Mexico, but then many other countries joined the boycott and didn't send the presidents uh, to the conference, to the Summit of Americas. Um, actually, at the end of the day, 12 of 35 presidents didn't uh, go to the summit, which is a huge failure. So in June 19, we had the victory of Gustavo Petro in Colombian uh, president election. This is the first time ever in history that a leftist uh, president will run uh, Colombia. And remember, there was this, there was, it was also a big blow to the U.S. because that uh, Colombia was probably the the, the biggest uh, real backyard of U.S. in the last decades. After that, uh, we had a few days after that, we had the BRICS uh, meeting in Beijing. Uh, that was also a very historical meeting because uh, that was the first time that the, all the countries, the five countries of BRICS, China, Russia, India, South Africa, and Brazil agreed to expand uh, the, this group, which is also a very significant uh, decision. And then this uh, might change some of the uh, correlation of forces in the next year or a couple of years um, in, in, in the world. And right after that, we had also NATO meeting uh, in Madrid a few days after. There was also a historical meeting because it was the first time first that Australia, Japan, South Korea, and New Zealand attended. And all, was also the meeting where uh, NATO countries agreed to expand uh, the, uh, the alliance to Finland and Sweden, uh, historically neutrals, neutral countries in, in, in Europe. So, and also I just would like to point to one as a historian, uh, we like images and, and, and also symbolic uh, symbolisms is that is also very significant if that we had a BRICS meeting in Beijing, which is of course one of the main centers of the global south and symbolizes all the, the vib vibrant energy coming from the global south and, and uh, trying to recreate a, a new world uh, order. And at the same time, you had the, the NATO meeting in Madrid 
where after all, everything started, all the disgrace of the global South is started when in 1492, uh, the, the, the Spanish empire sent Columbus to invade, to start the invasion of America and all the exploitation and genocide and, and slavery and, and everything that uh, we are still suffering from until today. So it's also very symbolic to have in the same week, a Beijing meeting of the Global South and a Madrid meeting of the, of the uh, uh, NATO countries, but we could say of the empire. So, I mean, and, and, and after that, after June, I mean, how many things already happened? How many new agreements uh, between Global South countries are happening, especially regarding trade, uh, regarding alternatives to uh, the US dollar? Um, and also, of course, as we know, especially who are living in China, uh, what happened in the last week with the with the the stupid visit of Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan, and everything that uh, is is going to be triggered uh, after that, and is already happening as we can see. So I think the first of first thing that I would like to point is this uh, specific and very critical moment of history, and that, as Lenny said, looks like I mean decades are happening in just a few weeks. So this is the first point. Second point is to think about the specific uh, situation of Latin America. So Latin America is, it's again leaving um, a, a wave of progressive governments. So in the last couple of years, um, again, progressive uh, presidents are being elected. Uh, we already have in Argentina, uh, Bolivia, Chile more recently, Peru, Colombia is the last one. We have Mexico also a couple of years, three years ago, uh, Honduras, and of course, Cuba, Venezuela, and also in many aspects, Nicaragua. So we have a situation that has some similarities of what's happened in the 2000s. I'm not going to go into that right now because, because of time. But um, as most of you know, we also lived a very important uh, wave of progressive governments in the 2000s, starting actually in 99 with the election of, of Chavez in Venezuela and passing like to um, Argentina, Brazil, Bolivia, Ecuador, Paraguay, Uruguay. So it was also a very special moment that, uh, again, without going to details, uh, some of these experiences was actually um, um, damaged by uh, U.S. interventions, direct and indirect interventions of United States in the continent. And, and, and especially what happened to uh, Brazil and Venezuela, I would say um, that was like two key countries leading uh, these, uh, this wave of progressive governments that were very damaged uh, by the U.S. We had uh, all the sanctions uh, choking Venezuela's economy. And we had, of course, uh, like a sort of like a light coup um, against President Dilma in Brazil. And, and then we had the second coup, which was uh, the arrestation of President Lula, um, uh, excluding him from the elections in 2018, elections that probably he would have uh, won. And now we know, especially in the case of Brazil, we know uh, there's a lot of the documentation that was leaked a few years ago, now we know that Department of Justice and the FBI uh, were working directly with um, sectors of the right wing in Brazil to undermine the Workers' Party government and to, um, uh, I mean, to organize a coup against Dilma and to put Lula in jail. So this would this happened um, a few years ago. Now we have this new wave. Of course, some things are very different, and I would say, in terms, if you think about uh, the the pros and cons of this new wave. I would start with the with some of the, the cons, which first of all, the left in the continent is less strong than it was in the two thousands. Um, people's movements are less mobilized and more fragmented than a few years ago, and of course, we miss uh, stronger leaders as President Hugo Chavez and of course Comrade uh, Fidel Castro. Um, and also we have a big challenge ahead because the economic crisis, the global economic crisis would hit our economies, 
of in, is already heating uh, our economies, and this would not um, this would last uh, at least a couple of years. And this, of course, might bring tensions uh, to our governments. So this as some of the problems we have, but we also have some some pros, some advantages. I would say, first of all, um, again, uh, bringing the what uh, Professor Wang Wei uh, just said, there, there's a new mood globally. So, I mean, US is making a lot of mistakes. Europe is also following uh, many of these US mistakes. And Global South countries are more and more realizing that our interests are in contradiction with the empire. And this is not only, of course, uh, uh, left or even progressive governments. Some governments, like some right-wing governments like India, as we, as we saw in the last couple of months, the many um, uh, declarations, many statements uh, from gov Indian government against uh, some of the uh, US um, a bully <laughs> against India regarding Russia, or we could talk about Turkish government, uh, Indonesian government, and even, I mean, South African government just a few days ago, you saw that uh, the foreign minister of South Africa uh, actually gave Blinken, gave a lecture back to Blinken. I'm sorry, you don't need to come here and to lecture us about democracy. We know how democracy works. So you see, I mean, almost every week, we, you see different manifestations from leaders from the global South challenge U.S. narrative challenge uh, U.S. bullying against our, our countries. And let alone, coming back to uh, Latin America, what President uh, Lopez Obrador from Mexico uh, are, I mean, first are saying, is saying, for instance, he was the one who called for the boycott of the Summit of Americas. And uh, he also said, for instance, that the Cuban embargo, the embargo, U.S. embargo against Cuba, six years, he said is the equivalent of a genocide because it killed many people already in, in the island um, because of lack of access to food, to medicine, and, and, and to like basic uh, um, uh, stuff for the people. So also another advantage is that, that this is the first time ever in the history of the continent that we have Mexico, the second biggest economy of the region, and Colombia, which is now the fourth, sometimes the third, uh, is like with Argentina, they're always um, uh, rotating, but we have Mexico and Colombia for the first time in the history, uh, both uh, run by progressive and leftist, actually, uh, even leftist governments. And of course, we still have Argentina. It's, the Argentina is a different situation, it's hard, it's, big chances of the of right wing coming back next year. Uh, there's big fragmentation also happening in the left right now. But anyway, we still have uh, the second, the third, and the fourth economy of the region run by progressive governments. And of course, in two months, if we have elections in Brazil, if Lula wins, we're going to have, for the first time in history, the fourth major economies of the region run by progressive government. So this is this is something absolutely new. And of course, if Lula wins, uh, all the efforts that are being made now by Mexico, by Argentina, Venezuela, Cuba, other countries, to rebuild our regional platform called CELAC, the Community of States of Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, if Lula wins, of course, I mean, he already said that. And I mean, Brazil was one of the also countries pushing for the uh, building of CELAC in 2011. Um, so, I mean, if Lula wins, we're gonna have a big step in that direction. Let alone, of course, uh, the uh, strengthening of BRICS, because also this is what now is, uh, I would say it is missing uh, for the strengthening of the BRICS is to have Brazil uh, back in the track. So, and the last thing I would say is of course, what's happening to Russia right now um, and even China. So there is like a, both countries are more than ever uh, willing to build Global South alternatives. And I would say, of course, Russia, because obvious reasons, but also China, if you think what was China's position in the 2000s during the first wave of progressive governments in Latin America, of course, the relationship between China and the US uh, was very different from now. So, 
we could say that in that moment, China would not uh, probably not agree uh, to do any move, any movement towards Latin America that could challenge the domination, the historical domination of US in the region, which now looks like very different from uh, from 20 or 15 years ago. So this is, I think, the uh, general situation of Latin America in terms of some of the um, weakness that we have compared to 20 years ago, but also some of the advantages we have compared to 20 uh, years ago. So finally, to finish, uh, just a few words about the relationship between China and Latin America. So I think one of the major questions for Latin America and Caribbean countries right now regarding uh, the uh, relationship with China is that this relationship, does it open a window of opportunity for a popular and sovereign project in our region that could overcome our historical position, subordinate to uh, imperialist powers, especially US, or China's rise, um, economical, political uh, rise, could also have the risk to reproduce a sort of like a center periphery relationship. Um, and remember of Andrea Gunder Frank, one of the major uh, theorists of the uh, underdevelopment in Latin America, this relationship between China and the Latin American Caribbean countries um, would, would have the risk to, uh, to develop the underdevelopment of our region. This I think is the major uh, question mark uh, for our countries right now. There's no doubt that the relationship between China and Latin America countries, so it's critical for the region. We could, I mean, there's many data we could uh, talk, we can talk more in the debate. Uh, just for instance, like the, the trade between, I mean, bilateral trade grew from um, $15 billion in 2001 to $450 billion last year. With a reasonable trade balance, I mean, China has, 6.5 billion uh, surplus. Um, also, between 2005 and 2020, there was $158 billion in investments, direct investments from China into the region. And there are many other like astonishing numbers in terms of the how much uh, China is crucial to the economy of Latin America. And, and, and finally, in, in 2020, for instance, Latin America and Caribbean received 10.8% of China's foreign direct investment. This is the, the um, I mean, besides Asia is the region who received more investments from China into 2020. So there's no, there's no doubt that is crucial for our economy. But the, the main question I think for us and, and thinking also um, reminding of uh, Professor Wang was saying is that of course, we, we should think of beyond only uh, trade and beyond uh, economy in the, in the sense of it's not only about to reproduce uh, capitalism and to reproduce the historical center periphery uh, relationship. Because the problem is that, of course, right now, most of this trade is Latin America, Caribbean countries uh, exporting natural resources to China, which, of course, China needs. And, and China is responsible for 28% of the global manufacturing. So of course, it needs natural resources. But at the same time, uh, we know all the limitations uh, for the countries and for the, the, our economies and for our people of this uh, kind of uh, uh, economic um, pattern. We know that agribusiness and mining is super concentrated sectors. They are very damaged to the nature. So this needs to be uh, discussed and needs to be uh, controlled by, by, by both sides. And also, of course, in terms of, I mean, it doesn't create a lot of jobs and, and also not uh, uh, jobs with um, high level skills. So for economy in the long term, I, I can take the, the case of Brazil. 89% of the exports from Brazil to China right now are four products. 
it's soy, oil, iron ore, and beef. So, I mean, in the long term, this, of course, it's not so beneficial to Brazilian economy. Of course, it's good for big multinational companies, big agribusiness tycoons uh, from Brazil, um, big mining companies, but this is not the best for uh, the people, our people, uh, for the working class. So this is also, I would say, it's a very important task because, of course, this is not role of China. Uh, it's not China who has to propose a different relations uh, to uh, the countries of our region. It's our countries, our governments need to propose, need to reestablish some sort of national popular uh, project and to uh, propose to China. And China already had give many examples. We can talk more in the debate. Uh, even in, in, in South America, in Latin America, China already gave examples that are willing to change some of these uh, patterns. Um, so, but this is also a task of our people's movements, our unions, our or people organizations is to push our governments, our even our progressive governments, of course, to uh, uh, to be more strategic in this relationship with China. And I would say two main things, of course, reindustrialization. Um, this is what most of our countries, especially these big economies, like I was saying, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, and um, and Mexico, who uh, has suffered in the last decades of de of deindustrialization and uh, precarization of the economy, and of course labor rights and, and, and welfare, et cetera. And the other thing, of course, would is to create alternatives to uh, the dollar, because this is also one of the key uh, tools that US have to dominate the whole world, but of course, uh, uh, also our region is um, to control finance, to control um, uh, the currency. And this is China again is, is a leader, a global leader right now in the creation of alternatives. So this is also something that together with BRICS, together with CELAC, um, uh, and actually there's a, already a forum established between China and CELAC countries, as the same as they have in Africa, the China FOCAC. Uh, uh, so, I mean, th this would be um, some, uh, I would say the strategic um, uh, issues to be tackled in the next years in this relationship between China and Latin American Caribbean. So uh, to finalize, I would say this, uh, I think we, 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 have, we, we have a window of opportunity in, in the region right now. Um, China can be strategic. And, and of course, uh, I mean, depending of how this, this uh, relationship develops in the next years, this could also mean a huge blow to the United States, uh, United States in, in the region. Um, because remember, as I mean, Biden was uh, like a two months, three months ago saying, oh, no, no, Latin America is not our backyard. Latin America is our front yard, as if it was better. I mean, we don't want to be anyone's yard. We want to build our house. We want to live in our house. And, and I'm sure that, I mean, China is specialist in infrastructure and construction uh, and in construction, not only of a house, but I think, uh, this relationship between China and America has a huge potential to help building a new world order. And this is what we need. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I'm ending here and very happy to uh, to uh, listen to Mika's presentation and also participate on the debate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marco. Uh, we will go into a dialogue among the panelists later. So now I would like to invite uh, Michaela Nondo Uskok. She is a researcher and editor at Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, and she's an educator of Pan Africanism Today Secretariat, which coordinates the regional articulation of the International People's Assembly. She has an MA in history from the university currently known as Rhodes and is a graduate of the Unit for Humanities at Rhodes University Fellowship Program. She is also part of the No Cold War Coordination Committee, a peace platform promoting multipolarity and maximum global cooperation, and a member of the Dongsheng Collective. In the last few years, 
She has been dedicated to work that builds the international networks of social movements, trade unions, and people's organizations on the African continent, with a particular focus on education and solidarity work. So the floor is yours, uh, Mika. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great, great. Thank you so much. Um, I am really grateful to be part of this conversation, part of this platform, and thank you to all the coordinators, organizers, interpreters, participants, and of course, most importantly, the audience um, who have joined us today. So uh, I'm going to give a short uh, presentation where I'm going to use some slides, but before I do that, I did want to echo the sentiment that's already been shared by Professor Wang, uh, by Marco, is that the empire is clearly in crisis right now, and that's an opportunity for us. For example, in the context of Africa, Marco mentioned briefly, we are seeing how they're panicking. If I can take the example of the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, last Monday he visited South Africa to propose the new US strategy towards Sub-Saharan Africa. And it was very interesting. You could see the scramble and the shift that is happening as they scramble because just a year before this, when he met with African heads of states online, he was cautioning them in a very paternalistic, uh, patronizing way around cooperation and collaboration with the Chinese people and the Chinese government, basically saying, be careful of what they're going to serve up. And yet a year later, you know, when he was talking in Pretoria and South Africa, he's giving these platitudes of, we're not asking the African people to choose. We want what's best for the African people. All of these hollow words, because when you look at not only that um, US strategy towards um, Sub-Saharan Africa, which came out in August this year, if you also look at the NATO strategic concept that was released earlier, they still have a paternalistic and very reminiscent of the colonial attitude uh, the way they position Africa and the global South, where they talk about also if Latin America is the is the front yard or backyard, then they talk about Africa as the southern neighborhood, as if it's like, you know, it's still a territory that they kind of have main surveillance and purveyance over. So we're seeing that they're scrambling in a moment where they're losing grip of global hegemony politically, economically, even in the attitudes that different African leaders are showing. And I'm going to touch into that a little bit um, more, but I just want to share my screen as I present. Uh, I hope you can see. Yes, you can see my screen, okay? Yes. yes. Thank you. So um, as the topic of the conversation today, well, I just wanted to touch a little bit about what does solidarity, non-alignment, and a new international look like for people like us in Africa who are trying to build a people's movement in Africa. And so when we are approaching this you know, conception, we have to ask ourselves what determines the kind of strategic solidarity, strategic non-alignment, and a strategic new international uh, that would actually advance the social development, not only of people in Africa, but people across the world. And there are three areas I want to touch on that I think we have to confront and that we are trying to confront in our organizations, in our movements, in our cooperations and collaborations um, to build a more progressive world order. And one is the historical and material reality, which I'll touch on. Two is the kind of theoretical tools and the nature of the battle of ideas that we are currently faced with. And three is the contemporary movements that are happening, whether it's at the level of states and uh, governments in Africa, as well as amongst grassroots movements and organizing. And I first wanna share, I think it's still extraordinary, and I'm not sure what the audiences uh, know, how much they know about Africa, but despite having struggled for over a century for full independence, we still find ourselves in a deeply inegalitarian situation characterized by capitalism and imperialism, where the world's 22 richest men, their combined wealth is more than all the 325 million women in Africa. These are the same mostly white Western men who are descendants of the centuries of exploitation. These are the likes of the Elon Musks who today have actually grown their wealth, not only from the labors of these African women and their family, but also their lands and their resources. 
And if we're looking across the continent, this is one of the richest continents in terms of mineral and natural wealth. We have the biggest sources of platinum, cobalt, coltan, all the key components um, that are necessary for technological advancements, um, for social advancements, for medical advancements. And in the same breath, I just want to share, alongside a prevailing uh, neo-colonial, is how we describe it, a neo-colonial situation, we also have it bolstered by an immense US and Western foreign military presence on the continent uh, that continues to undermine not only our sovereignty, but undermines the territorial project for unity that in uh, 1963, at the inauguration of the Organization for um, African Unity, now known today as the African Union, a more tame version of the continental institution, there was clear calls for a rejection of these kinds of incurrences on our sovereignty and incurrences on our ability to organize as a territory or as a continent. And so just one example just to throw out is that we have one of the biggest foreign US military bases in Niger, which is a West African country. And this um, drone base basically supports the French exploitation of uranium. One of the biggest uranium sources is found in, a, in, in two mines in a town called Agadez. And this uranium is supplying one out of three light bulbs in France are powered by this uranium in, in this small town. And yet, if you look at the population of Niger, and this is a conservative estimate, it's one in seven Nigerians have access to electricity, which is one of the lowest rates in Africa. So we find ourselves, despite having immense, you know, social, natural, mineral, ecological wealth, we still continue to see 640 million Africans with no access to electricity. We still have one in three Africans facing water scarcity. We still have almost half a billion Africans who face food insecurity, uh, as well as having big shortfalls in terms of in infrastructure financing. We have like an annual um, infra infrastructure financing gap of around $100 million a year. So the situation is quite dismal in terms of looking at that massive uh, uh, gap. And this comes out of a, a colonial leg legacy that we're seeing as neo-colonial. Um, the picture on the on the left, or my left, maybe your right, is of Cecil John Rhodes, who was a mining capitalist who came uh, in the 1890s, 1880s, and established the kind of industrial mining complex that would basically begin the burgeoning of the new capitalist century of the 1900s. And I wanted to raise, since we were talking about ghosts and specters, there are many, many, many specters. And this is also a day of ghosts in Africa. You can find it almost, you know, in any part of the continent, you'll find some level of, of class resistance from working people um, to the opposition of the kind of capitalist and imperialist world order. And one of them that I wanted to mention is today is also the anniversary of a massive African miners strike in South Africa in 1946, where black African workers were demanding better wages, better work conditions from the colonial government at the time. And almost 70 years later in 2012, between 10 to 16 August, we had the very tragic Marikana massacre of mine workers who were essentially fighting the descendants of the foreign mining industrialists, London or London mining, who had gunned down their ancestors almost 70 years ago. So I just wanted to share this because it's astonishing when you consider, for example, China's development in the last 70 years, where we've seen a socialist experiment lifting hundreds of millions out of poverty, whilst in Africa, due to the continuance of financial strangulation and our inability, as Professor Wang said, to become an emerging you know, country where we are developing according to our internal policies, not just simply exporting our wealth, um, as you know, he mentioned what Samir Amin said, as rentier states, as rentier economies, we've been unable to fully realize our own development. And I, I put this image of um, Elon Musk with Trump, which is a poster created for a campaign around uh, imperialism through the IPA, the International People's Assembly, is because simultaneously the same capitalists who continue to strangulate um, the world, the peoples of the world and exploit them, 
they continue to undermine, uh, as Professor Wang said, the principles of non-alignment, which again, almost 70 years ago, was calling for ensuring sovereignty, was calling for territorial integrity, was calling for national independence as determined by the people of those nations. And so part of our project that we are trying to embark on is that in order for us to struggle and attain the kinds of demands um, and materialities we deserve and we seek, we of course have to have the correct theoretical tools. And that is part of uh, myself and Marco are both in Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. And part of our work is precisely to salvage class analysis and emancipatory thought. And I think it's okay, it's amazing that today is the anniversary of Samir Amin's passing because it's precisely his kind of intellectual work, his anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist um, over that we in Tricontinental have trying to build on. And in fact, one of the last interviews uh, that was conducted with Samir Amin was by our institute, which I, I uh, encourage everyone to go check out on our website. We publish in multiple languages. I'm not sure if this one is in Mandarin that I'm talking about, but we do have it in multiple languages and hopefully soon we'll have it all in Mandarin as well. But one of the main things that we gleaned from this interview that informs the kind of work we are doing is when we asked him about the relevance of Marxism today, Samira Amin said, and I quote, I think Marxism is more important and relevant today than ever. We need Marx today. Of course, we should not just repeat what Marx said in his time, but we should continue his mode of thinking, that is to give Marxist answers to the present challenges. And so uh, I just wanted to highlight that this year is the fifth year, the fifth anniversary of Tricontinental operating, and we are an international institute who are guided by popular movements and organizations. And we are trying to bridge the gap that has been created and is, is a purposeful creation of um, you know, bourgeois public media and academia and the public sphere is bridge the gap between what social movements and political movements are doing and how their voice is being amplified in the world today and how their correct position is being amplified in the world today. So drawing on Marx, we very much have that approach of, you know, philosophers are not just here to interpret the world, they should be trying to change it. Um, and that's what really, I think, distinguishes us from many groups across the world or in at least the global south. I also wanted to highlight that the kind of work we've been involved in is trying to illuminate what contemporary capitalism looks like, trying to identify the monsters and how they work. Monsters such as Jair Bolsonaro and the history of you know, military dictatorships. Why is it that that's the case? As well as we want to produce work that thinks about what the future of our people are. What are these socialist constructions alternative that we want to create in the world? And um, one of the documents that has been really key to that is with a group of, I think, 34 institutes, we've produced a document called A Plan to Save the Planet, which for us, we, we know we have to give proposals, we have to give demands, we have to give answers to our people's movements. And so the plan to save the planet, which you can find on our website in multiple languages, is a document giving key demands in different areas of life of what we want and not what we want as an institute, but what we as working class people, disenfranchised people, marginalized people have been organizing for, uh, for many, many years. So I, I just wanted to raise it or promote our institute because we work hand in hand and alongside um, these trade unions, social justice movements, peasant groups, uh, from Brazil, the landless workers movement, to the socialist movement in Ghana, to the Tunisian workers party, to, you know, uh, women's groups across Latin America and across um, Africa. And so why, once we start to grapple with the fact that, and we're happy that there's this re-emergence of interest into uh, the theoretical tools we get from Marx, from Lenin, from various um, figures of, of class and emancipatory thought, we are, as Marco and, and Professor Wang already mentioned, entering into a move moment where there is an appetite for non-alignment. And I, you know, this is despite the fact that we still have a neo-colonial relationship with the West. 
Um, but we have seen, first of all, before I go, get into this chart, we've seen how in um, Mali, Burkina Faso, there's been a clear rejection of the French, the former colonizers of that region. And in Mali, they even ejected the French military uh, presence. Unfortunately, the cases, these are some right-wing forces or conservative forces, but clearly there is a mood and an opening um, around our relationship to former dominators and former colonialists. And it's already been mentioned in passing, but I just wanna say it again, if you're looking at this map, at the level of states, when African nations were asked to side with the US NATO-led war in Ukraine, um, Africa, which forms part of the 6.7 billion people whose governments refused, for example, to impose sanctions, we see here that at least 30, I think it's 30, 26, sorry, 26 of the 54 member states, Africa, African member states in the UN, um, at least half, um, almost the majority in some form or another, whether they abstained or voted against or were not in the room, um, they rejected the US position. They they don't, and not to say because they are necessarily pro-Russia, it's because they don't want to be involved and in being dragged into um, US-led wars and US-led um, attempts to control the world economy. Um, so we are seeing a shift and perhaps it's not something uh, qualitative, but quantity will emerge in quality if we continue to push around the question of non-alignment. Then what has actually made this possible is one, as Mark, I think, mentioned, there has been growing consensus that the US and European presence in the African continent isn't helping Africa to deal with our deepening social and economic inequalities, whether it's from security questions, we have a massive US military footprint across the continent that does not serve any kind of security function, but more as a gendarme function for capital and financial capital. But also to the questions of basic human rights to food and electricity, as I mentioned, how is it that a uranium deposit in Niger is not serving the people, but serving French interests? But another aspect, and Marco spoke about it in relation to Latin America, and I wanna briefly mention it, in relation to, to, to Africa, is that the rise of China and its role in Africa has started to show us that there is another world possible. So currently, there, uh, China is Africa's biggest trade partner. I mean, last year was actually, we had a big jump. We were up 35% in terms of bilateral trade around $254 billion. And in many ways, this rise in the last 20 or so years and the growing relationship between China and the African continent has now given us different options and different choices. And I, I emphasize options and choices because we didn't have this uh, previous to this, let alone in colonial periods. And so having the choice between, you know, a China Exim bank loan, which a uh, lot of the Chinese um, loaning systems have, you know, lower rates of return. They have longer maturing periods. They aren't tied to any kind of conditionalities around restructuring our economic policies. These are all seen as options, not solutions necessarily to all the deep problems and structural problems, but definitely options that allow us to leverage our own um, agenda and our own sense of self-determination. And of course, you know, I can mention all the various projects that have materially shifted the lives of African people, whether it's, you know, big railway projects or in uh, Nigeria, the Mambila hydro project, which is among many different um, renewable energy projects that have been started up, whether it's the digital Silk Road, which we've seen extending 15,000 kilometers of fiber optic cables that link Africa to Europe as well as Asia, whether it's the fact that now around more than 60,000 African students study in China, which is second to France, and France only has that accolade because of being a former colonizer. So this kind of process, with all its shortfalls, with all, there are many limitations, is still providing alternatives that allow Africa a better footing to leverage for its own interests and for its own gains for its people. But ultimately, and this is where the last section I wanna talk about, I have about four more slides, is that 
we, like many other countries in the global south, are still beholden to governments who are conservative, who seek profit over people, who have a disregard for their populations. And so we can't leave it up to our governments um, to resolve our issues or attend to our issues. And two of the big issues around how we leverage then a continental or regional bodies um, kind of collective power, collective bargaining, has been around has been limited by the fact that there are two um i think that i want to mention internal and external issues and it's around um fragmentation in the african union particularly i want to give the example of in the peace and security council because um, if we look at internal fragmentation one example is that only months before there was going to be a meeting in may 2011 um oh no not 2011 sorry in um 2005 i think it was the peace and security council which is the security council of the african union which is representative of the continental body they were supposed to send a deployment of around 5000 troops to burundi who at the time was undergoing a civil war but when just before they were going to send these troops the president at the time kurunziza he pushed back against this agenda and basically blocked the political, I mean, the Peace and Security Council's decision. And so within the African Union, there is no cohesion or consensus on certain basic questions, even in the question of peace and security. Then we also have the external pressure that we saw most acutely in 2011 with the NATO invasion of Libya, where the Peace and Security Council, they met, they drew up a fully fledged roadmap on how they were going to dial back the conflict in Libya. And days before that, literally days before leaders were going to go to Tripoli um, or were leaving from Tripoli, we saw that the bombing of NATO took place where they basically used the UN Security Council Resolution 1973 saying that they were going to go in under humanitarian intervention and it quickly exceeded the UN mandate and became a form of regime change. So, in terms of internal and external pressures and issues, the African Union doesn't necessarily, at this stage in history, have the capacity to exert an independent, uh, self-determining agenda and follow through with it. Which is why for, for many of us, um, myself, Marco, and many others possibly in this call, is we are heavily invested in building the power of popular movements and popular organizations. And this is particularly uh, important because Right now, in the last 10 years, we're finally in Africa, at least for, from our perspective, we're finally waking up from a sort of fatigue that we've had uh, from the 1980s and 1970s structural adjustment programs, which demolished our internal capacity to build um, our own economies. Then in the 1990s and the 2000s, we saw the kind of NGOization of civic space, where NGOs uh, were taking over and were pushing for reform rather than more radical changes that were necessary. But in the last two decades, I would say, we've seen a kind of awakening from this lethargy where we're seeing how people's movements are not only protesting, but are organizing. And I just wanna mention some of the, the people, and this is an image from when we had a meeting in 2018 in Winnebagana of over 400, um, activists, trade unionists, political leaders from 62 or so different countries. This was the first time in 2018 in Winneba that we had a gathering on the African continent of the size of people's organizations. Um, and I say this because there were gatherings in previous times, but this happened either under the orbit of state meetings or prior to the independence movement. It was actually in like, the Europe and in the UK that we had various anti-colonialists and national liberation leaders meeting. And so we're seeing finally a moment where we're entering into coordinated organization of popular energies to want to change things. We have political parties like in Zambia, Tunisia, the democratic way in Morocco who are capturing the imagination of working class people. We're seeing people organize around um, social rights, such as Abatali Basem Jondolo, which is a shack dwellers movement in South Africa that has over 100,000 um, members, and they organize against 
you know, ev 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 evictions. They organized for land and housing and dignity. And we were also seeing various trade unions and peasant organizations like my, my trade union in South Africa, the National Union of Metal Workers, as well as Mviwata, the Tanzanian Peasants Movement, pushing more towards uh, radical ideologies, experimenting in ideas around socialism, educating their membership around an anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist project. So we're seeing a lot of hope. We're seeing the beginnings of a, of a shift from you know, quantity of protests happening across the African continent. I used to live in the center of Johannesburg next to City Hall and every single Monday, there would be some community group or small union coming to protest for their demands. But now we're trying to push towards how do we galvanize these forces into a more unified step in, in collective campaigns and collective forms of work. And so I just wanna mention that from this 2018 meeting, which for us is a key landmark in our, our international work, in our continental and regional work, is for the first time we agreed and have been building on consolidating a pan-African social movement that is explicitly anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist. We agreed and have continued to push the question of socialism and how socialism provides an alternative and Marxist tools of analysis allow us to better understand and grapple with and overcome our, our fraught realities. And we also agreed, and we've been doing this through various ways of building political education work, building solidarity work, sending international brigades, learning from different socialist experiences in Venezuela, in Cuba, et cetera. So we, we're feeling something different. We're hoping that we can take the opportunities that the new vistas of China's rise, of um, the African states being more reluctant to go along with the US agenda. And we're hoping we can shift that to more qualitative leaps and steps in the future. So I'm gonna end with three things. I'm going to just share a, a short video of the International People's Assembly, which is the kind of international coordination body of um, the different movements. And it's been operational for the last six or so years. And we're really excited for the work that we've been doing in the space, bringing many different people, different organizations who don't necessarily agree on everything, but who agree that another world is necessary, not only possible, but is necessary because of the deep inequalities and ravages, not only on human beings and their lands, but also on the natural environment and the planet. So I just wanted to share that small clip. And the last, last thing I will say before we go into a question and answer and some dialogue is I do wanna raise the concern that Marco also touched on around, ultimately we don't want, whether it's Russia or China, we don't want to recreate any kind of periphery center relationship reminiscent of colonial or neo-colonial times, but we, it's up to us, we in our different continents and our different regions, to build people's power that can leverage any kind of governmental and state to state relationship in the benefit of the people. And I just wanted to raise this because I was at the forum on China Africa uh, cooperation, which happened in November, 2021. And two things stood out to me is one that amongst the African delegates, there was the sense of lethargy or sitting back and just allowing China to offer what they had to offer, but not a sense of trying to put forward a collective agenda 
of trying to put forward what the needs of African people are and to stand as equals next to the Chinese um, delegates. And why this stood out so much to me was that in President Xi Jinping's final address, he ended with a quote that comes from Leopold Senghor, who was the first president of Senegal. And the quote goes, and it's a call to, to African people, to African people to assert their agency, is he says, let us answer present at the rebirth of the world. And so our tasks as those who are organizing for the rebirth of the world is to be present in all spaces at all levels if we really want to see the kind of new solidarity, new non-alignment, build a new international. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so before we go for a round of interactions among the three speakers, I would like to invite Professor Dai. The reason uh, putting you in the position of moderator, co-moderator, is for you to speak your thoughts and make comments, and we have the, the audience who very much wants to listen to you. So, Professor Dai, please. Thank you, Tianqi. Today, I would like to thank all three speakers on behalf of myself. Professor Wang is rather powerfully engaging in something that's quite more urgent, yet I cannot find a breakthrough that is how to swap the 20th century historical resources or heritages for, for the benefit of benefiting the world 20th century reality. So, I mean, is our common mentor and common, common leader. From his side, he extended something that is also important for contemporary China, that is the theory of the, the three worlds and how China's socialist practice were accomplished against the background of Asia, Africa, and Latin America resistance against the colonialism. Right. We are also thinking about our practice against the background of this global lands landscape of crisis. Of course, I'm also very thankful for our two discussants for their input of examples from Latin America and Africa. Because for a very long time, what I be able to get my hands on uh, the for for all the failure of big capital. But when they fail, when they fail, it is the time for the emergence or the rise of a resistant power. And our two discussions today brought different perspectives and news from Latin America and Africa. They can see that as the crisis of capitalism, vast capitalism, roll out they can see the new force of the right le sorry left wing movements and the reorganization of the people the this pan-africanism and the pan-latin americanism they used to have by the beginning of the this century these forces used to encourage us and inspire us and once again they are active on the global stage and they are visible to us now. I remember some day late at night at the beginning of the century, I received an email from Kinchi and I open it. In there is a song that I do not, I'm not familiar with. By the time it wasn't even done, I know it was, I learned it is the song of Lula. It's a song that celebrated the election of Ving of Lula, but then after that, we faced the multiple failures and multiple bad news. Not long ago, we shared this documentary of Minju, the Bianyuan on Brazil, on, on our class. We, we did that with Kenji. We, 
it made us feel disappointed or even dis or even depressed. The three speakers today talk about the passing down of thoughts and theories in terms of new analysis and new narratives. We can see that against this backdrop of expansion and hegemony of capitalism, there is also this factor of communism, of solidarity among the third world countries. So I am very grateful for all the speakers today and also grateful for Ken Chi who was able to put together this ninth South South Forum. So um, while we wait for uh, Professor Dai to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to come back again uh, after uh, rebooting. That is okay. Uh, uh, so I'd like to see if uh, Professor Wang would have anything to, to respond to the other two speakers. I am very grateful for both discussions for Marco and Mika for their discussion. Their discussion are both very educational and inspiring for me. Just then, Professor Dai also mentioned that they brought us the latest news, the latest issues on our struggles. First of all, I would like to talk about. Um, as Marco mentioned, the whole of Latin America is witnessing a new wave. This is continuing. Also, in my, my presentation today, I also especially noted that at the beginning of the 20th century, they, they emerged the, this, no, sorry, by the beginning of this century, there is this wave of socialism, uh, Lula, Brazil, Venezuela, and many other countries will mention, then they faced countless difficulties such as Gudeda and all kind of stuff the economy was also part of the problem. This recent wave is very encouraging, uh, no matter it's Brazil, uh, it's not still quite clear uh, whether Lula will be elected, and then uh, the victory of the lapping of Colombia, and then the reemergence of the lapping of Mexico, and then the situation in Argentina, all this wave as compared to the last wave of victory of Lapping is a great emergence. I believe in some way this new social practice of learning from the first wave of socialist movements, so it may bring about new possibilities. So it's extremely encouraging. And I also agree with both of them in that the factor of abundance today is a great 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 factor of uh, First of all, uh, somehow he encouraged Argentina, the U.S. hegemony in this backyard is no longer as influential. Uh, I am very heartened by the recent developments of Latin America. I believe this period followed the first wave of at the beginning of this century, I, should, I had some takeaway from the first wave, so I can learn from the experience. I don't know very much about this, but I've always keep a keen eye on this, especially traditionally, Latin America has been referred as 
the the backyard of the U.S. and now we see the bankruptcy of the Maronism. So this is very encouraging. Mika talk about the issues of reality and theory, and both of them especially mentioned China and China's role in Latin America and Africa. First of all, China's emergence, China's presence. China is currently the biggest trade partner of Africa. And China's role and what China does will be of great importance. From the perspective of Africa, China provides choices. And it also has something to do with what, how China will, what China will do as now it's currently the second biggest economy in the world. As China becomes the largest economy part, economic partners, so there are problems we, uh, among the relations between the, the um, China and the, and the Latin American countries or the African countries. I believe this point is important to Chinese society and all these different aspects along with the one belt and one road initiative all these questions all these problems are going to 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 recur so i think this is important but this one point the choice means in the global south that there is a new there's a new new um new element that is different from from the 70s 80s or 90s uh, this is a completely new in the global south and it and uh, it goes back to China and also the emerging countries and also what Professor Dai mentioned that the, the tradition of the 20s and its transition, because objectively, China's, China's uh, uh, approach was often read as the mainstream that is benefited from the neoliberalism school globalization. But from what Samir Amin mentioned that from the point of view of the linking without China's revolution and the social revolution, there is, it's very hard to understand China's development without the, without taking the social revolution into account. So this actually offers a good example for the other developing countries. Thank you. Okay, now I can hear you. I don't want to waste people's time. No, 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 please, please uh, start. Don't worry. <laughs> Professor Lau, you are very stubborn. <laughs> okay, so I was talking about like, uh, so when the 20, at the beginning of the 20th century, there's the left wing wave of the Latin America turning to the left inspired inspired me and also the region of China and the intellectuals in China. Also my colleagues and friends, the whole community. But then later on, we, we again started to be alert because we can see one after another, all the left wing uh, countries was encountering a series of setbacks. We also tried to visit in Latin America at that time, trying to observe what is going on. And after that, in Brazil, we can see all of this like conspiracy, but it is like very, very brutal and also like out in the light. All of this, uh, I remember that at that time I was discussing a, a documentary called The Margin of Democracy, at the margin of the democracy. And I remember that we can see all the left-wing power, including Lula, how was, how was it turned upside down in Brazil? At that time, we, we suffered this kind of, what I felt was disappointed and also kind of despair. That's why I'm very grateful to hearing that this, this powerful, this, this, the evil, the, the, the evil alliance, after the evil alliance intervention in Latin America, we once again see the wave of the left wing, left wing power. And also I'm very happy to hear about the pan-Africanism. Pan we saw that along with the neoliberalism, globalization, this 
initiative might prove to be impossible. But what we have saw from the photos and what we have saw from the videos, we can see this, this power of collective. That's why um, at that uh, at the beginning of the South South Foreign, I was appointed to uh, to to do a, a, a to present a lecture. I also quoted from the uh, from Ru Xun about the about the hope about the disappear despair. But I'm very grateful to the three speakers. You guys showed us what is the real hope, and also the the, the how the theory can be put into practice and how the power of the mass uh, and the power of the left wing is not can, won't admit defeat so easily so thank you let me make me believe again that's it uh, so now i would like to invite marco to respond um to to the previous uh interventions marco please I just want to reinforce some of the some of the comments, um, especially uh, Professor Dai. Um, yeah, I think we are living a it's a different moment right now in America, and and especially I would say Brazil. It's we are like two months from the elections, and and Brazil, I mean, had a very is a was a huge uh, blowback in the last six years. Like extreme right wing was in power for the last four years, and and this ultra neoliberal uh, government that devastated the country. We're right now in a situation that I don't think we experienced this in 40, 50 years, uh, in terms of like poverty, even like hunger again. Uh, so it's a really uh, a difficult moment for the country. But at the same time, it's true that it, it is also um, uh, like a special moment because, I mean, you know, we know that crisis situation sometimes uh, also bring people together and, and mobilize people. So I, I think, um, I mean, Lula has a big chance of winning the election uh, in October. And and Lula winning again, it's not gonna be. I don't think it's it's only only about changing Brazil situation. It's gonna change Latin America situation, and it's gonna change the global situation. So I think it's a uh, um, it's it's a moment of hope again, Professor Dai. And just last thing I would like to say, um, also um, bringing um, some comments from from Wang Lao Shi is that. Um, last year, we made this uh, organized interview uh, with Lula uh, to Guancha uh, here in China. And there was a specific moment that uh, Eric Lee was asking Lula why um, it was so hard for global South countries to, um, to be able to trace this development path. I mean, we attempt for many decades many of our countries and it's always hard and there's always blowbacks and there's always uh empire strikes etc and and lula gave like a very surprising i would say answer that day he said you know what because eric would say yeah but why china did it and why most of the global south countries did not and I would say the last thing I was expecting Lula to answer, and he did it. He said, you know what? The difference because China did a, a socialist revolution. And because, because of Communist Party of China and the leadership of Mao, Zhou Enlai and, every, and everything, and, and the mobilizing of the masses and the huge struggle of Chinese people, you were able uh, to change uh, the destiny of China after a hundred years of humiliation. And I, I'm just, I'm just reminding this because, uh, again, to Professor Dai, why I think this is a moment of hope to the country. I mean, we never heard Lula talk about socialist revolution and how this uh, was crucial uh, to to any country in the world. Lula is a leftist, but it was not a revolutionary. It's him himself. And I think the experience that Lula had, uh, he's remember he was almost two years in jail, and now it's clear 
that U.S. was directly working to put him in jail. So he learned with this experience. And I think the, the, the third Lula will be a different Lula in, in this sense. For one side is true, the right wing is very strong right now in the country. So it's going to be a moment of sort of some sort of compromising. But the Lula in 2022 is a Lula who experienced personally the, the direct attack, attack uh, uh, from the empire. And he, I mean, I think he is now much more experienced and, and he's much more aware of all the, uh, the, the tricks that the empire might try against Brazil and Latin America again. So I think it's, uh, and, and, and again, the mood of the planet is different. The mood of global South is different. So I think we, we might have chances. And of course, we're not going to change history without people's mobilization, without people's struggle. So I think this is the biggest challenge. And I still think that at next year's Latin America, we're going we're gonna to see some, some important shifts in our region. And we hope that, of course, with some support of China, that will be strategic for all of our countries and our people. Thank you. Uh, I would just maybe want to touch on two things is one, um, even though I think there's a lot of opportunity and there's a fissure right now that we can take, um, that we can use to our benefit if we organize correctly and we organize um, people's energies correctly, we can't underplay the fact that there are huge obstacles that we are confronted with. Uh, for example, uh, how is it that now with the Ukraine crisis or the Ukraine war, I think it's the increase in wheat prices, for example, the estimated increase a couple of months ago was 40%. And 33 low-income African countries depend on at least a third of their wheat imports coming from Ukraine and Russia. And so in a moment like that, when we're faced with, you know, high food prices that have a material impact on ordinary people in Africa, what are the opportunities for us, whether it's within our country, with, whether it's in collaboration with China, to recreate relationships and economic activities that will benefit the people and will kind of feed into becoming an emerging, emerging economy? Because we've seen at a, large, a rather small scale, um, Chinese agricultural exchange and agricultural projects that have been massively beneficial, like um, Professor Yuan Longping's hybrid rice has had a, a massive benefit to many countries, specifically Madagascar, I would highlight as one of them. And we've seen various small scale projects, whether it's um, adaptable forms of mushrooms that are very cheap to grow, whatever it is that have been really beneficial to the kind of agricultural projects and agroecological projects. But we, we definitely are like resting on the kind of sword's edge where it could go either way if, if we're not careful. And then the other thing is that a massive challenge, and I don't know if it happens in the same way, Marco, in Latin America, but it is a big challenge in relation to China, Africa, to have a rational and adult conversation about China and Africa. There is a huge offensive um, and a huge kind of media infrastructure that demonizes even the most basic conversations. I mean, I might wake up tomorrow and see that I'm, a, uh, uh, I'm being funded by the Communist Party of China to speak on this platform. And you can't have a rational conversation and rational engagements in, in the bourgeois public sphere, at least in, in Africa, because a lot of it is not only funded by, like directly funded by the National Endowment uh, Project, by the George Soros Foundation, all of these big capitalist entities of the West, but it also has a historical alignment to Western um, media projects, Western ideologies, etc. So even just having a general conversation that is rational, that is adult about how we can navigate our path forward on the African continent poses many challenges. So it's not to, I hope I didn't underplay that we, we do have many challenges in the African continent, but we are trying in different spaces, whether it's the Dongsheng Collective, uh, myself and a colleague, Amadeus Musumali, uh, started a, a podcast called The Crane, where we're trying to have conversations about this, whether it's through Tricontinental, we need to forge and create space where these kinds of rational and critical conversations can be had about the challenges that we face, 
and ultimately that it's not a reformist position to be strategic about certain uh, agreements because we 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 have short term um, directives, but we have to see how they feed into long term projects um, that would actually help to emancipate and advance the development of people in Africa. Uh, thank you. Uh, although we are not going to have much time left, uh, it's a ver very rare opportunity for so many of us to come together. So I'd like to invite um, Firoz uh, to speak and then uh, Beatrice to say a few words, but please keep it brief. Uh, Firoz, please. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to, to say I've missed a few comments. I think it's been an extraordinarily interesting uh, discussion here. Um, we're living in a period of, of, of capitalist decadence, a decay of capital, and, and, and with this incredible deindustrialization that has taken place, uh, almost removal of the entire productive sectors in the center, and the, and the growing financialization being the primary characteristic of capital. And China stands out as, uh, as an exception in, in limiting the degree of financialization, but has invested massively uh, in the productive uh, uh, sector and in the infrastructure. If liberalism gave birth to colonialism, so we must recognize that neoliberalism, the liberalism of the new era, uh, neoliberalism has given birth to neo-colonialism. And, and I think it's really important to, to recognize that our capitalist class and our elites in Africa have become in many ways members of the global capitalist class. They have a vested interest in perpetuating neoliberalism and benefit from it. Uh, they, they accumulate huge wealth. If you look at the last uh, uh, 30, 50 years uh, in, in Africa, you will see that how immiseration, how impoverishment has increased immensely and a tiny elite has really uh, um, uh, accumulated massive wealth. And I think the COVID pandemic actually illustrates very clearly the kind of priorities. And that is, uh, if you're in the middle classes, if you're part of that, that elite, you're, you're, you get pierced by a, by a needle. If you're part of all the rest, the people who live in the informal sectors, the, uh, everyone else, you get pierced by bullets. That's the difference in the, uh, the approach. The third point I want to make is that Amilcar Cabral made it very clear. He was absolutely clear that you cannot uh, occupy the colonial state and its structures, its judiciary, its armed forces, its police, and expect it to behave any differently from what the colonial state uh, was about. You cannot use a gun as a healthcare instrument. You need to demolish, he argued, the colonial state and create alternative structures of popular democracy. There is so much attention paid to elections at the moment. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm, it's wonderful to hear from Latin America some of the positive outcomes of, of elections. But my fear is that if that, that, that if it, all that happened is to change government and not replace the colonial state with popular democratic structures, then I think all you are getting is, is an a, anachronism, a social democratic state uh, being created uh, in 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 a uh, in a in a situation where there has been a disorganic state uh, over over protected by by military uh, and where the dominance of financial capital uh, continues, but the degeneration of capital, the the decay of capital, its decadence at the center presents clearly an opportunity and especially as there are potentials for breaking the dominance of the dollar. The problem is most of our elite have their money stored in banks in the West in dollars. So they have no interest in doing so. And so therein lies the, the, the a clear 
uh, uh, contradiction. My final point is that there's also this this um, uh, love affair with with uh, the the, the philanthro capitalists, Gates, Agra, and so on and so forth. Um, but we should also be aware that the non-governmental sector are also not immune from the influences of uh, philanthro capitalists. Let me stop at that point. Thank you very Thank you, much. Thank you, Firoz. Uh, Firoz is from Kenya, and he is the coordinator of the Global University uh, 11 Lectures uh, series on Africa. And he's going to coordinate a second series in a few mm. months on the thinkers of Africa. Thank oh. you, Firoz. Now, Beatrice, uh, Beatrice is from Brazil, please. So it's a pleasure to be able to speak in this important uh, mis uh, discussion. I'm speaking from Rio de Janeiro, and I was uh, very, very impressed by, by all the uh, former speakers. And particularly, I would like to mention to you that yesterday in Brazil, there was a very important day because by the initiative of the students of the law school in Sao Paulo of the USP University started uh, processes that uh, it could have been nonsense, no, not important at all, but in, in two weeks time, it converted this uh, very humble initiative of the students to redact a charter for democracy into a huge movement of the civil society, Brazilian civil society, to sign this charter. And nowadays, there have been more than a million and 2,000 signatures from the charter that has been read loudly yesterday in all the main cities of Brazil with huge mobilization of civil society in a very interesting uh, initiative that joined some of the representatives of the bankers of the very important financial sector with very important representative of the trade unions of students unions of um, movements of civil society in diverse um, ways and mainly with the initiative of youngsters so I myself, uh, I wasn't very optimistic of this uh, possibility of Lula way, uh, in, in, the com in the way that the campaign was, the, the electoral campaign was going on because the society was so, so still, uh, apparently very, 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 uh, not very in interested in the campaign. But yesterday, surprisingly, for most of the country, the initiative transformed the campaign into a very massive demonstration pro-democracy, so huge and so important with so much figures of the different ways of, of, of thinking the society that even the mainstream media was obliged to cover it and to dedicate huge time to analyze. So uh, I think that uh, all what uh, Marco have said and Michaela in relation to Africa is, is really very important because as uh, I myself, I think that the great difference in relation to, pa to the past is that the initiative of the real transformation is coming from the lower part and the most strategic part of the society. 
So uh, I would like to finish this. I, I just want to to mention that important mobilization, yesterday's important mobilization, and to thank all of you because of this important discussion we have, and also to mention my pleasure to see again Juan Hui, whom we met in Latin America, and also to know this important intellectual, which is Professor Shiha here, and to thank you all for this excellent discussion. And let's trust in our future, in our common future of the South. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, uh, Victor Hugo uh, from Ecuador. Victor, please. First of all, I would like to greet you cordially, everybody who has participated in this seminar, in particular, the, the richness of the different participation interventions from our panelists who have given us a very interesting and strategic participation about the different things and paths we should move forward in southern countries. I would like to only mention three aspects of the aspects of the of the topics that were discussed in this panel. First of all, I share this idea that Professor Dai mentioned that it is important to maintain uh, some kind of positive hope. And this should be based in my view on the internal work that must be carried out in each one of our countries. We say that political transformations should be carried out from the bottom up. And we also have to go from what is local to national and from what is national to international level. We are at this time facing a challenge, the challenge that is moving from resistance to proposal of transformative policies, political participation that can signify access to government. There are many examples, many social movements that have uh, been stumped because they have no political representation that can continue these actions at the level of the state at the level of electoral democratic processes and projects. At this moment in Ecuador, for example, we are participating in, uh, we are seeing and witnessing dialogue between indigenous movements and the government to establish new policies that stem from a mobilization that covered 18 years and practically paralyzed the country. So from Quito, Ecuador, my greeting here it calls for an understanding that without social mobilization, without popular unity, we are not going to go beyond uh, beyond theoretical proposals of change. We have to be present in state institutions for a new type for to establish new types of policy policies, and these initiatives should stem from popular and social movements, as we are seeing in Colombia and Ecuador. A second aspect that I would like to mention is the need of establishing a new type of relationship, international relationships based on the defense of food sovereignty. We cannot go beyond mere discourse if we do not establish policies for a new type of international trade, particularly among neighboring countries where we have similar or supplementary products for food, for nourishment, and we establish a different type of trade, a different type of price agreements and quality control. And so we are not subject to the impositions by transnational companies like Monsanto or others. Another very crucial issue, in my view, has to do with establishing a type of strategy of nationalist business strategy. We cannot continue to depend on transnational companies that are exploiting and pillaging our natural resources, our natural goods that some people call resources, natural resources with a capitalist export led criteria. If we do not establish new policies among countries so as to establish business type alliances for energy transition, business alliances for the rational use of 
mineral and oil resources, then we will again fall into the same old capitalist market led dynamics and we will start, we will continue to enrich in the same common actors. Finally, I would like to point out to the fact that we need to change our attitudes in social movements and progressive political parties towards the relationship with Chinese invent investments. We salute uh, the uh, Chinese investments in Africa, where China is the main foreign investor, but we do not speak about changing the ways and the dynamics of this investment, of these investments. We mentioned a new credit policy for productive innovation and investment in the rural areas, but Chinese investors only ally with neoliberal policies in the government. So it is an investment that does not foster a new type of development. And as one of the panelists mentioned, we are developing under development, remembering Gunther Frank. I believe then that we need to have a critical view, a critical understanding of this international foreign uh, direct investment, not only from China, but also from other countries, so as to be able to counter challenge these policies of hegemonic investment dictated by organizations like the IMF and other international organizations that are in charge of the financial world. So I salute these brilliant interventions, the participations today and the presentation to go beyond theory and reach that hope that Professor Dai was mentioning with concrete solutions and resolutions in relation to change at the international and national levels. Cordial greetings to all of you. Thank you. And now uh, I'd like to invite Gustave Messiah. He's uh, from Egypt and France, and also a good friend of Samia Min. Gus, please. And uh, thank you for, for this uh, very rich discussion. Uh, we are entering now in a very difficult situation. The one that Gramsci defined as a battle for cultural hegemony with identity and securitarian ideology on one side and the ideology of equality and solidarity on the other. And this battle concerns the vision of freedom. For one, it is libertarianism on the one hand or individual and collective freedom on the other. I want to really to thanks to Kinshi and Margaret Jed and all the speakers for this South South University, which preaches the voice of the global South in the invention of a new world. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gus. So uh, we have actually quite a uh, about 10 questions from the audience, but because of the time, we are going to read only two of the questions. So, um, so we have two questions. The first one is posed to Professor Wang Hui. You mentioned in the interview on the topic of Lu Xun that according to Lu Xun, a revolutionary has to always to be a revolutionary of failure. So how do you define victory and what kind of hope should they have for our ideal and our career? The second question is to all three speakers. So how can civil society create links with solidarity and new international other than uh, on a national basis how to aim for socialism uh, i'd like to invite mika mika first so this is also the last round of comments from our three speakers so mika please thank you so much um and thank you also for all the inputs from the various audience members because totally agree um the 
how of it is the question of how we forge a new path that both, I think, as Feroz said, can ultimately smash the neoliberal system, as well as what Victor said around how do we still find ourselves being impactful in the existing um, system that we find. So in terms of civil society and the links to solidarity, right? That was the question. How does civil society act in the interests that might produce solidarity, right? Um, I think this is kind of like a, a, a bit of a challenging one, especially in Africa, because civil society or the space of civil society has been predominantly occupied by non-governmental organizations who historically have an allegiance to our former colonialists and tend to perform a role of quietening the kind of radical voices and movements of the people. But I think what civil society can do is to produce space for those active movements. For example, in South Africa, we have this shack dwellers movement, Abashali Basem Jondolo, who have faced massive repression when they're trying to reclaim land for social good, for public benefit. And we've seen in just in this year alone, at least three, four people have been assassinated by various organ, uh, organs of the that are linked to the national uh, ruling party. And so for us, it's like, if you have a platform that could amplify the voices and amplify the advance of various social movements, then that's how you should use it. Because much of the time, social or oh, civic society is amplifying or speaking on behalf of existing organizations rather than amplifying their voice, rather than showing solidarity, whether it's materially or whether it's just speaking out. So I think it's to create space for the existing working class, poor, marginalized uh, organizations and groups to speak for themselves. Because ultimately, that's part of the challenge that we face in Africa is the monopolization of that kind of civic space in NGOs and people who don't necessarily either come from the continent, who represent the interests of the continent, or who are trying to advance uh, the basic demands that are coming from social movements. <laughs> But this is a this is a short answer for a longer conversation, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marco, please. Oh, so thank you very much for all the inputs uh, from the audience and, and like such a also like important people and very pleased to hear the inputs. Um, so, I mean, basically about this question about civil society, I think uh, I totally agree with Mika. Um, I mean, also in Latin America, we have this, um, in the last decades, we have also uh, this sort of historical battle between NGOs and most of the time NGOs are driven by, um, uh, I would say, mainly US interests or, uh, or European interests. Or even like a middle class uh, interest nationally, and and for the other side we have the mass movements, the people's movements, peasants, unions, and and this was with like a long tradition of struggles we have in our um, continent and region. So um, that I mean, this is something I I mean I think Mika also raised. Uh, in her speech about, for instance, one of these um, attempts um, and Tricontinental is also part of this attempt to rebuild some sort of international uh, people's uh, platform movements, which is the International People's Assembly um, present in, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, and also even North America, because uh, there's still people's movement struggle in the uh, belly of the beast. So I think this, uh, of course, and also agreeing with comments from um, of uh, Victor Hugo in terms of how uh, we need to, uh, I mean, there's no way of, um, of building real transformations in society uh, just from the state. We know that. Um, I mean, it's, this is like the task, the main task of the left in the in, in in the whole world, especially in the global south, is how to uh, reorganize and um, our movements 
because this is not a, like a, an easy historical moment, right, for, for the grassroots organization, but how to improve political education of the masses, how to improve the organization of the people and, and the ability of the people uh, to uh, reclaim our rights, to reclaim our national projects. Um, so that's, that's what something I was briefly trying to mention. And I think this is one of the contradictions, of course, we have uh, regarding um, Chinese investments and Chinese uh, and relationship with China in our in our continents and global south is that this is not always the, our this this uh, relationship or disagreements are driven by um, people's interests. Of course, I mean even in the case of Brazil right now, um, I mean the agribusiness is very happy with uh, exporting hundreds of millions of, of of dollars of soy every year. But this doesn't mean that this is good for, for the whole country. But again, I don't think we have to expect from China to change the situation. This, uh, this is our task. This is our people's, our, also, also our government's task is to, uh, uh, to propose to China a different relationship. And I think in many cases, I, we, I mean, we don't have time here, but even like recently what was happening in Argentina, some of the very interesting agreements that Argentina government proposed to China in terms of um, energy uh, uh, projects, uh, uh, energy sovereignty, um, very in a very um, beneficial way to Argentinian uh, people and, and Argentinian uh, state. So I think this is uh, one of the things that in the next years would be crucial uh, in the region is how to push our uh, governments, our states from uh, bottom up, from the people's uh, interests, from the people's mobilization, how to push for um, uh, real national uh, uh, sovereignty projects. So anyway, it's an uh, endless struggle of the people, um, but I still with all the, the, the challenges we have in the next years, um, as uh, Beatrice was uh, uh, reminding us, we need to keep the hope and, and the struggles and the organization of the people. So thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, great uh, debate and I hope we can keep the dialogue in, from now on. Thank you. Thank you. So now we invite Professor Wang Hui to, to speak. I will just respond briefly to uh, what the other speakers told about how can we do how how do we from bottom to top. So in from the Chinese history since the 20th China's social revolution, what we can see the relation between the top and the bottom. This kind of inter interaction is very important. So we need a corresponding a correspondent. Uh, uh, base, for example, a revolutionary party and how to connect with the people, I think is very important because the, if the mass doesn't have their representative in, it's very difficult for them to, to, for, for them to, uh, to, to, to speak out in the public space. Secondly, if, to be against or about or the fight against the medium uh, hegemony is very important. It is relevant to every society. How, apart from the society, what we, that we're normally talking about, Samia Min mentioned these five monopolies. One of them is the monopoly of the information and medium. So on international and domestic level, they, it, they are omnipresent and also they are connected. So. They are, there's work to be done on this aspect. And I was also mentioned briefly about, uh, about Lu Xun, about Lu Xun mentioned about the, 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 the testimony of, um, of uh, defeat and victory. In 1926, Lu Xun mentioned this, discussed this uh, about the, 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 the defeats of Sun Wen, of the Sun Zhongshan, because Sun Zhongshan, has lost has lost so many battles, but he keeps standing out. He keeps standing back up, and so Marco mentioned about Lula. Lula has been has spent two years in jail, and these two years for him doesn't defeat him. He that he was not despaired from this 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 two years jail life, but he 
he has a brighter view on his future. He has a clear, clear way to, he knows where to go. So this is what I talk about the, the, uh, the teach, the, 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 about what is the defeat and the, the victory. So that's why I mean the left wing, the new left wing wave in the Latin America comes from the defeat of the years ago, of the decades ago. That's why on top of the defeat, we can find hope. And victory is not is never just like uh just like with a graph. It's always after so many times of defeats that we it, that is that, that is possible. So let's not forget on the whole whole globe, the imperialism is still very strong and the danger is still eminent so only when we can when we can be courage when we can be only can when we are brave and not afraid of defeat then we should we will have the chance to overcome it so that's what i mean about the to be a a, a, a revolutionary that is not afraid of being defeated thank you and, and last, let's invite our co-moderator, Professor Dai, to, to give a conclusion of our session. Professor Dai, please. I'm very pleased to, to, to after such a prolonged discussion, and when it is already the end, that after 30, more than 30 days, there are so many, there are so many, we can see many openings of uh, discussion. And also there are lots of presentation of different kinds of social movements. So no, I don't have a conclusion and there is no ending to this as well. Let's once again, start from here and we'll keep on going. And what we mentioned about defeat and victory all that, or you can call it the philosophy of the of the defeated, or the relationship between the defeat of and victory. Actually, when the when the colon, colonial colonialism uh, and occupied Latin America, you can see waves of people's fighting, people's resistance, and from this, I I understand four words. It was four words in Chinese, which means keep on fighting although i mean keep on keep keep defeating but keep on fighting well this is not just an this is not just a self um, mocking of the defeated this is really an attitude of fight of resistance i believe this process is uh, is is also very is very important that's it that is a beautiful ending to this session um, so now I would like to uh, thank all our speakers today and all the other and all the inputs uh, made by our friends. Mm -hmm.